Um, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Chi Jing, and today I'm going to talk about our recent results in reinforcement learning with linear function approximation. This is a, a joint work with my wonderful collaborators, uh, Joran Yang, Joran Wang, and my PhD advisor, Michael Jordan. So I guess uh, we have been through two days of uh, reinforcement talk. I will just make the introduction very simple. So we have a lot of theoretical results in a tabular reinforcement learning, which has been deal with um, the problems with small number of states and small number of actions. Well, in practice, we usually encounter problems with enormous number of uh, states, like in the Atari games. So we need to introduce a new mechanism called a function approximation. That is, we either approximate the value or we approximate the policy by some class of functions. And definitely, this uh, function approximation introduces uh, a whole new, a lot of new series of challenges. And so, so that's uh, one of the reasons why, even till today, there are very few, very limited theoretical understandings about function approximation, especially in those settings involve exploration versus exploitation trade-offs. And this field understanding even applies to a very simple setting, which is about the only we only consider linear function approximation. So this will be the focus of this talk. By linear function approximation, we really mean we parameterize our Q value in terms of something linear in a feature of a linear in a feature map of S A and some unknown weight vector W. Okay. So it turns out, uh, in practice, uh, people usually use a uh, linear function approximation. It works reasonably well. And there's a well classical algorithm called a least square value iteration. To introduce that algorithm, we first recap ourselves uh, about the classical value iteration algorithm. It's basically just an opt uh, optimal Bellman equation. But instead of uh, using the exact expectation, what we use is empirical expectation to replace the, expe ex and the true expectation. However, in a function approximation setting, this, uh, this may be a little bit tricky because uh, the right-hand side can be a nonlinear function. So if we directly apply this update, so my Q value will no longer be a linear function. So a very naive idea is uh, why not let's just do least square. I can parameterize my Q value as a, as a linear function in terms of feature phi, and uh, I perform this least square updates and I use the least square solution as my new approximate Q value. This is just gives us a, a new algorithm called least square value iteration. And it turns out, so this, we have a very fundamental question here then. For a very basic algorithm, least square evaluation, how many samples does it need to learn a reasonable good policy in the linear function proxy setting? Although this function sounds very simple and very basic, it turns out we don't really have a very good understanding of these problems. So what is really missing in this community uh, uh, like to solve this uh, very basic problems? It turns out for so many years, uh, we have been focused on, um, we were trying to solve this problem under, under this assumption. That is, uh, we only assume Q star, the optimal value function, is a linear function. So as a, as a talk in this morning, Shams talk, it, you already mentioned this assumption might be too weak, to, might, might not be sufficient to guarantee any positive results. Because uh, Shams results kind of already show if uh, I guarantee you Q star is some almost linear function, then there is no algorithm can find optimal policy in polynomial time, in polynomial samples. So what we should shoot for instead? If you're very familiar with the optimal Bellman equation, you should know this assumption is really just saying the summation of rewards and uh, the transition is actually a linear function. But it does not say anything about uh, the rewards or transition itself, whether it's linear or not. It can be anything wild. So why not make a more reasonable assumption? We believe maybe the true, maybe the assumption we should look for is really we just assume both the transition and the rewards are linear. This is actually the uh, L linear MDP assumption also studied in a lot of previous work. By reward linear, it's very classical in the bandit community. By transitions linear, what we really mean is that the conditional, uh, the expectation, expected value of the next states conditional on the current state S and A is a, linear, is a linear function of the feature map of current SA and some weight vector W. And the weight vector W only depends on the value function and independent of the current state and action. Although this sounds like we make some additional assumption to this and make it less general, but it turns out this assumption is still reasonably general. First, it definitely holds uh, applied to the tablet MDP, so it's a more strictly more general case. It also holds for a very um, classical control problem called LQR, which people have been a lot of interest in these problems. So it turns out really this additional structure is really what we want, what we really need to guarantee a very um, strong um, 
a positive results. So this is what we prove in our paper. We can actually show for linear MDP with no additional assumptions. This is a very classical algorithm called least square evaluation with some UCB exploration bonus. We can find an epsilon optimal policy within this number of episodes, where D is the dimension of the features, H is the length of episodes, D cube H force over epsilon square. So the most important thing here is this algorithm actually only requires polynomial episodes, polynomial runtime, so everything is polynomial. And uh, other than this dimension dependence, we actually pretty convinced uh, both H and epsilon are relatively sharp. So the main takeaway of this results is that we actually provide a very basic guarantee now for the linear function approximation case, and also it's by a very simple algorithm, just least square value equation with some UCB bonus. So finally, I also want to just uh, briefly mention there are a lot of actually wonderful prior works uh, in this community, including the works by Lin Yang and Mandy Wang and also John Lanford, and who is in the audience. And some of the work is even applied to more general setting, but when they apply to the linear MDP setting, they either require additional assumptions or they kind of like require exponential number of runtimes. So our results is the first results in the linear MDP setting without requiring any additional assumptions and achieve polynomial samples and polynomial runtime. Um, this concludes my talk, thanks. Um, hello everyone, so my name is Lin Yang. So I was a postdoc here uh, working with uh, Mundin Wang, currently I'm an assistant professor at UCLA, UC department. So this work is based on joint work with uh, Alec, Sham, Aaron, and Mundin and Yingyu. So it's about sample complexity uh, of a generative model in reinforcement learning. Actually, you have heard a lot of great uh, talks uh, in this workshop. It's about uh, different kind of uh, uh, function approximation about reinforcement learning, right? So let's actually rewind a little bit, consider the most basic setting, the MDP. So in this, uh, actually, it's an episodic MDP I'm considering. So this MDP uh, is specified by a set of states, set of actions, and reward function, which I normalize that to be in between zero and one. And I also have probability transition. Uh, this is just a general MDP model. So in, uh, because it's episodic MDP, so you really consider the length, the, the, how, how many plays you need to take, right? So that's the horizon of the MDP, so, uh, which, is a, which is a large number, H. So now the, we're really considering the policy that achieves a good uh, expected reward. So I read the policy here that's a map, uh, mapping from uh, the states to the actions. And then the reward is simply the expected the reward of uh, all this uh, action you're taking on this horizon edge, okay? So our goal is to obtain a good policy. By good, I mean that the policy has to get a value that is very close to the optimal, to, to the optimal value. So now in the reinforcement learning setting, the probability transition and the reward is not known to you. So now uh, we can see this very basic question, like how many samples do we really need in order to obtain a good policy? By good, I mean as you, let's say a constant suboptimal policy, your policy is at most constant away from the optimal value function. Turns, turns out that for this very basic question, previously uh, there's no, uh, it's not known for the optimal sample complexity. Actually, and more specific, previously, uh, previously known one is that the sample complexity is linearly depending on the number of states, number of actions, but the dependence on the horizon is not clear. There's a lower bound saying that actually the, the, the lower bound says that the dependence should be something, let's say, quadratic on the horizon, but the upper bound is just some large polynomial. So it's not clear what is the exact dependence on the horizon. So in order to tackle this question, so let's consider even more basic setting, this generating model. So in the generating model, basically you have a very strong oracle. You can sample every, uh, you can sample a lot of samples from every state action pair. Basically, I'm shutting down this, uh, this exploration. Like in reinforcement learning, you really want to uh, balance the exploration and exploitation. Now I just shut it down, shut this exploration down to see what is the actual sample complexity for this very simple setting, okay? But in fact, even for this very, very simple setting, the dependence on H is not clear, okay? Okay, so for this simple setting, what is the algorithm that we can have? It's actually quite simple. Uh, the, the most natural algorithm is the so-called empiric risk minimization. So basically, this kind of algorithm is so natural, right? So we just grab a bunch of samples from each state action pair, 
Then we use this sample to estimate an empirical model. So we just get a bunch of samples, and that's uh, for my each state action pair transition to another state. Then we count how many of them from this one to this state, and divided by the total number of them, we get the empirical probability estimated. So using this empirical model, we can, we can use dynamic programming to solve it. Then we get a policy, we get a value, we get everything, right? This is the most natural algorithm we can have. And for this simple algorithm, turns out before result, the understanding is not clear. So previously, the best understanding of this simple algorithm says that the upper bound, the sample dependence, is that, uh, it, on this horizon is uh, power five dependence. Still, the low one is uh, uh, h to the three. So we recently showed that this actually, this simple algorithm is statistically optimal. The dependence of the horizon is exactly h to the three. Okay. It turns out that this thing, this understanding, this analysis of this algorithm is not that easy though. So we, we, in the paper, we showed that the estimation error of the algorithm is actually uh, characterized by this, uh, by this quantity. So let me explain you more, okay? So here, this v hat uh, star is actually the optimal value function of the empirical model, okay? So the p hat is the empirical model, not the, uh, not the true model. p is the true model. So basically, you have an inner product of the uh, empirical model with the optimal value function minus this true model with the uh, uh, optimal value function for the empirical model. So this equation resembles the lots of concentration inequality, right? It's really this one is an empirical estimator of the mean of this, uh, of this optimal value function for the model, for, for, the, for the empirical model. But turns out you cannot apply this concentration inequalities like Hopkins bond or Bernstein bond because they are independent. Basically, this, this V hat is ca calculated using this model. So even though these two are two random variables, but they are dependent. Okay. To apply this concentration inequality in our paper, we're using some decoupling argument with some uh, leave one out kind of analysis to eventually decouple those two random variables and eventually get the optimal bond. You can understand that we are converting this uh, S-dimensional uh, epsilon net to a one-dimensional epsilon net and eventually get a very tight sample complexity. If you are interested, you can look at our paper here. And there's a slightly problem though. So this algorithm is really a model-based algorithm. So you recall store the entire model. In that sense, it uses a lot of space. Basically, the space complexity is also uh, this uh, cubic dependence on the horizon. So we have another algorithm that's a variant of a Q-learning. It actually can achieve the same uh, statistic optimality. Basically, it's a, it's a modification of a Q-learning so original q learning algorithm, you know that you estimate the Q value based, a, based on the current Q value uh, estimation. So in that sense, you, in your estimate of the Q value, you have a random variable that, de that is depending on the current Q value. That random variable actually has a large variance. In that sense, you, you have to have a lot of sample in order to get a good policy. So in our paper, we use some checkpoint. This checkpoint is also um, estimated using samples, but you don't estimate that too many times. You can use this checkpoint to subtract, to modify this update. For instance, you subtract this checkpoint and add back another part that don't need to estimate many times. So this new estimator turns out to has, have a very small variance. Okay. In that sense, we have a good sample complexity, and also because this is a model-free algorithm, you only use a, a, a little space, okay? So in summary, so the optimal sample complexity depending on the horizon is cubic. But you know that we are using this generative model, right? So why, we, why are we care about this generative model? So in my opinion, generative model is really theoretically clean. You can analyze your algorithm, your com complexity very easily in this model. And also you can provide baseline for this exploration setting. For instance, if you approve a lower bound in this generative model, it automatically implies a lower bound for the exploration setting. And moreover, most of the time you obtain some upper bound in this exploration setting, it matches the bound in this generative setting. And lastly, it's corresponding to the simulators in, in practice. So there's an open problem though. So in the exploration setting, like Shama also mentioned this open problem, what is the exact dependence of this horizon if you want to get a, a good policy? 
So that's uh, my talk. Thanks. Thanks, everyone, for still paying attention on Friday afternoon. Uh, I'm Alec Koppel. I'm at the uh, US Army Research Laboratory. Uh, this talk, I tried to remove most of the math that I could have, but not all of it. Um, <coughs> and um, so I'm just going to overview a few recent uh, results we had that were like a numerical optimization study of uh, policy gradient methods and uh, actor critic in uh, continuous spaces in the canonical setting where um, you have an infinite horizon um, uh, discounted problem. And uh, this is joint work with a number of collaborators, including uh, Kai Ching and Tamer Bashar at University of Illinois, uh, Howe at uh, UT Austin, Harshat, who's sitting in the audience, and my former PhD advisor, uh, Alejandro Ribeiro at uh, UPenn. Okay, uh, good. So to start off keeping things light, if you'll indulge a meta metaphor here, um, this dog here is, uh, is Pearl, uh, my uh, 10 pound uh, Shih Tzu. And once she, uh, when we moved into our new place, she tried to run up the stairs and they're wooden so she couldn't get good traction. So she fell and then she became a little uh, fearful of running up the wood stairs. So just you know, indulge the metaphor for a moment as we try to make sense of these results about reward shaping that come from uh, some uh, numerical optimization uh, excursion into the analysis of policy gradient methods. Okay, uh, good. <coughs> so uh, in particular, um, you know, we uh, basically recently could characterize that uh, policy gradient methods are, are a variant of, uh, non uh, of stochastic gradient algorithm. Um, and uh, in the over continuous spaces, this is a non-convex, uh, it defines a non-convex problem. So you know, we establish their uh, convergence rates to stationary points. Um, but the, I think, most interesting aspect of this analysis um, is we could characterize conditions under which they uh, converge to approximate local extrema. Uh, and this hinges upon um, reward shaping. Um, so, so I think that's very interesting. Uh, in particular, um, we drive this uh, condition that if the reward Functions uh, absolute value is uh, uh, lower bounded away from zero. You know we typically assume it's upper bounded, so that's no big deal. Um, then the Hessian of the value function uh, satisfies something called the uh, negative correlated curvature condition. And then once you have that, then you get uh, uh, then you can come up with some uh, augmented step size rules that allow you to converge to uh, approximate local extrema. So I think that's very interesting because it's saying we should be doing some kind of reward offset and this intrinsically comes from the structure of the uh, Hessian of the value function. Um, and you know, we see this borne out in practice. So this is just a simple uh, demonstration. That, so the, the green curve here is policy gradient method using Monte Carlo rollouts for the Q function. Um, and we do some uh, re reward offset to ensure positivity. And this indeed uh, performs better than some of the, uh, let's say, more classical techniques where we're not doing re any reward offset. So this is like a very simple thing that we could be doing it, and it improves the, the performance of these algorithms. So I think that's uh, you know, inherently a, a little bit interesting because we just like add 10 to the reward in pendulum. No big deal. Okay. Uh, another thing um, that uh, we could uh, establish recently are the convergence uh, rates for actor-critic algorithms. So actor-critic algorithms are a variant of policy search where rather than doing uh, Monte Carlo rollouts for uh, the Q function estimate, instead you uh, run a two time scale uh, scheme where in the inner loop you're estimating the value function online. So here we're just assuming that the, or sorry, not value function, Q function. So here we're assuming that the Q function has a linear basis expansion um, and that uh, the features over that expansion are, are universal. So for example, an RBF network with large enough uh, number of features. Um, and for this, uh, for this situation, I think the interesting point is that the convergence rate to stationarity um, ends up being uh, bottlenecked uh, by the particular choice of critic method you use. That means the, the critic method is converging more slowly. Um, and so you, know, you get something slower if you run gradient temporal difference. You could come up with a certain accelerated variant of gradient temporal difference using like a Nesterov type scheme and that converges a little faster. And then TD, uh, TD for your critic estimate that, that converges faster if you're in a finite space, but it converges a little slower if you're in a continuous space. Okay, so these are all just rates to stationarity, but then the uh, counterintuitive thing is for 
um, just a, a basic navigation uh, problem. Uh, the, the point is that, uh, okay, over here on the left, oh, where's the laser? Over here on the left is the uh, norm of the gradient of the value function. Um, and so indeed, like this accelerated GTD converges very fast, and then TD converges a little, uh, you know, not quite as fast, but pretty close, and then GTD is slower. But uh, this doesn't translate exactly to uh, good uh, learned policies. So the, the kind of quandary, um, I think that this converges to stationary points um, in non-convex problems uh, is that, you know, even though uh, the accelerated one is converging very fast, it's converging to, uh, let's say, not a very good learned policy. So we kind of shade in this region over here for the, so for, uh, the problem being solved. And, uh, you know, um, <coughs> the uh, GTD and the uh, TD0 are, are converging more slowly, but to better learned policies. So this is inherently a little bit interesting. Um, and so I, I think one thing to point out, uh, much, much like my dog getting afraid to run up the stairs, is uh, you know, if you learn too fast, then, uh, okay, so here's our navigation problem. Um, you start over here, here's your obstacle that you get some negative reward for, and you're just trying to get to the asterisk there. So if you learn too fast, then you maybe you crash into the cra crash into the obstacle once or twice, and then the policy you learn is just to like flee the obstacle, and you never get to where you're trying to go. Um, uh, whereas if you learn more slowly, then uh, you uh, then we observe that the uh, agent ends up learning a policy that actually gets them to navigate uh, more uh, to the correct uh, point. And so you know you can uh, run different sample paths over the uh, over the, uh, over the policy and see how it works. And you know, better policies end up performing like this and navigating around the obstacle. Um, okay, so, uh, and then at the end of the day, I just want to point out that the reward shaping that we actually did was to paste down these little carpet patches so that she could actually uh, get up the stairs. So the point is like, if we want good reward shaping, then maybe we need to not make it uh, negative to hit this obstacle, uh, but you know, just to make it some, something smaller than getting to where we're trying to go, and then this will actually uh, induce favorable structure on the Hessian of the value function. Um, and so, yeah, uh, with, with that, I think that's about five minutes. Um, I can conclude, and uh, I think the main point of this talk is just that uh, reward shaping and slower learning is sometimes better for reinforcement learning, and that's uh, un unintuitive, or uh, at least the, uh, the optimization analysis doesn't uh, explain that comprehensively. So, yeah. Okay, good. So I'm Karan, and uh, I'm going to talk about some work that we have on getting fast grades on online control problems. And this is joint work with Naman and Alad. So the setting we consider is that of a noisy known linear dynamical system in the sense that we have the system matrices A, B, uh, and the system is equipped with changing convex costs. The online nature of the problem here is that we don't know the convex costs in advance. And in particular, CT, the cost at the tth time step is revealed only once you commit to the action UT at uh, the tth time step. And so changing convex costs are quite natural. They occur because of changing economic circumstances, because of budget constraints. Uh, but an important reason why we consider this problem is because it generalizes the online tracking problem. So the online tracking problem is quite natural. It's, uh, for example, here's some biological motivation. So if XT star is uh, an exogenous target, we are trying to steer our uh, control system to match the, the uh, online exogenous target provided. So I was trying to be original here, but Alex told the show. <laughs> so, uh, so the performance measure we consider is that of regret. So we want our algorithm to have low excess uh, cost in comparison to the best linear controller that is completely that has complete foreknowledge of all the uh, co convex cost that it's that it's going to encounter. So there's been quite a uh, there's been quite some work on this, uh, but uh, we provide an algor an efficient algorithm that gets polylogarithmic regret. 
And this is the first uh, algorithm to get polylogarithmic regret for stochastic uh, control problems. And not just that, in fact, like if you just take uh, the class of PST quadratic costs, uh, which is the mainstay of control theory, even then, uh, even for deterministic uh, settings, we are the first to get polylogarithmic rates. So instead of uh, telling you about uh, the uh, body of work, and this is a very biased sample, I'm going to instead maybe mark the conceptual departure that we make from conventional methods. So the conceptual departure is that uh, a lot of these methods uh, rely on dynamic programming. And the reason they rely on dynamic programming is that you can show that the cost associated with the controller is non-convex in case. So this is something that, for example, Sham and uh, co-authors uh, recently completely give a concrete example for. So as a result, what people do instead is not act on the decision variable k, but on the decision variable sigma. And what is sigma? Sigma is the state action covariance matrix that's realizable for any, uh, any control input that you can put into the LQR. The nice thing about uh, using this parameterization is that this in fact admits a very compact, efficient, convex description. And because of this change of variables, the cost now becomes linear in the state covariance matrix. So this is great because we have moved from something that is non-convex to something that's linear with convex constraints. And if the cost change, this is just a, a, an online linear optimization program. But in general, the point is uh, for online linear optimization, the best known upper and lower bounds are square root t. So this is uh, at least some justification for why dynamic programming-based approaches uh, somehow don't go beyond square root t regret. And even they have to assume uh, quadratic costs. So if this seems somewhat strange, this is just the occupancy measure view of, for MDPs, the analog of that. So instead, uh, this is something that a lot talked about yesterday. We, in a previous work, we consider an alternative convex parameterization of the controller. I'm not going to go over what this controller is, except to note that use, the, the variables in this program are m, and use the control that we play are linear in m. And as a consequence, because of the superposition principle that holds for linear systems, x itself is going to be linear in m, and which is why we have a convex program. The second feature to note here is uh, see, the, uh, the space of linear controllers, it has far fewer parameters than what we have here. So this is a, quite an over-parameterized system. And in, in this previous work, in fact, you can take our results and you already get square root t, not just for stochastic, but actually adversarial perturbations and changing costs. But the, uh, the other nice thing about this work is that it provides actually a very clean reduction. That reduction says, if you want to bound the policy regret, it suffices to bound regret on a cost sequence and suffer only log t additional cost. This cost sequence is the cost you would have suffered at the t at time step had you run a controller m from the very start. Uh, so again, in stateless online learning, if you have uh, strongly convex costs, it suffi that, that's a, that is sufficient to get logarithmic regret. So you would hope maybe if CT is convex in X and U, that's good enough, except that there's a catch, which is obviously that strongly convex in controls and state doesn't mean that you're strongly convex in the controller space. So there's a difference between control and controllers. Uh, and the second thing is maybe we have shot ourselves in the foot because we started with something that had dimension of x times dimensions of u parameters, which was a linear controller, and now we have far many. So in spite of uh, what you, uh, in spite of these suspicions, in fact, we, the, the key theorem that we show in this paper is that CT, uh, which is the cost uh, at the t at time step, had you played controller m, so this is a notion of somewhat counterfactual for us, uh, cost, it is in fact strongly convex in M. And just to get to this very quickly, so it, consider something even abstract. Let's say F is a strongly convex function. 
and you want f of ax to be convex, then it's sufficient to just show that AA transpose exceeds identity in some sense. And this statement, if you take an expectation, that's perfect too. So the reason I'm taking an expectation and putting in this A is that recall that uh, I said that X is linear at M. So that linearity is A, but that is stochastic because Ws are stochastic. Uh, so it suffices to, in, in fact, in the 1D case where I can at least write out what this, exp what, what this expression is, it suffices to look at the Jacobian, Jacobian transpose uh, of some sort uh, for, for the state to matrix derivatives. And this turns out to be a horrible matrix, it's but a numerical matrix, which is parameterized by H, and uh, so, uh, which is kind of hard to analyze. It's hard to show that it's PSD, so, or, or positive definite, in fact. So what we end up doing is uh, an analytic trick, which we have used before. In fact, uh, if you remember Cyril's talk, uh, it had the same flavor. So what we do is, if you look at any row, and interpret it as a function, because if you took it to be infinite dimensional, it would be a function. As long as you can show that it has some nice regularity. In particular here, for example, we can show that it uh, satisfies a homogeneous second order differential equation. Every time you can do that, you can try to guess the eigenstructure of the matrix. And the fact that this is finite and not infinite dimensional gives you some boundary conditions. So it's, it's, it's in some sense very like a physics way of doing things, where we guess and unsets, we put it in, and verifying that you have the correct solution is easy because you can always check if you have a certain eigenvector. So with this, we end up proving that this matrix is in fact positive definite, and we only lose another log t factor in this translation. So in the paper, we have uh, some uh, algorithms for moving even beyond what OGD gets you. Uh, please uh, contact me if you find that interesting. Thank you. Um, okay, hi. Uh, my name is Natalie. I'm a grad student here in Princeton, um, and I'm going to talk about our work boosting for dynamical systems. And this is joint work with my advisor, Lad Khazan, and uh, collaborators, Naman Agarwal and Zulu. Um, okay, so. Our goal is to uh, do boosting for, uh, for control for dynamical systems. We want to design a controller uh, to uh, optimize some target function in a dynamical system. Um, so specifically, our setting is the following. We have uh, a dynamical system with f specifying some uh, transition function. Uh, xt is the state, ut is the control. Um, and we assume that there is some disturbance wt that is added to the system. Uh, it could be random, but it could also be uh, adversarial. We have no assumptions over it apart from the fact that it's bounded by some constant. And we want to minimize the sum of costs, uh, some of the conf convex costs uh, over the state and the uh, action. And uh, specifically, we care about uh, minimizing the policy regret. So we want to be, uh, to um, uh, compete with the best uh, policy uh, in hindsight uh, out of some uh, policy class M. <coughs> Uh, so just to give a quick uh, background for uh, a technique that we're using here, which is online boosting for regression. Um, so online boosting for regression basically maintains a set of uh, n weak learners. So the weak learning assumption here, unlike in the uh, standard statistical setting for boosting, so here we only assume that uh, for a sequence of predictions uh, given by some weak learner, uh, we have a bound over the regret, some R of T. Um, and then, um, we have, uh, the, or uh, this previous work, they, uh, they have a, a boosting algorithm that combines uh, these predictions at every time step into a single uh, pred um, boosted prediction. So this, the way this works is that for every time step, uh, we combine all of the uh, predictions given by all weak learners, we predict that, we suffer some loss, and then we update each one of the weak learners um, uh, based on the mistakes of previous weak learners. So this is uh, inspired by, uh, the Frank Wolf uh, algorithm. And the regret bound obtained by this method is, um, so it seems like the regret bound increases here. So we have R of T, which is from the weak learning assumption, plus some term, which is uh, T over N, the number of weak learners. Uh, but the main strength of this result is that uh, this now competes with a stronger class. So if the weak learner competed uh, with uh, some class F, 
then uh, the resulting algorithm competes with the, the convex hull of that class. Um, so it's a stronger class. Uh, so what we want to do is utilize that method for uh, online control. Uh, so essentially we could also have uh, uh, different weak controllers. Uh, each one will predict some control action. We will combine them uh, into a single boosted controller. But the problem here is that the control um, uh, action affects the state. So assuming we have uh, some regret bound over a sequence of states uh, obtained by each one of those weak controllers, um, it is not clear how to get a meaningful guarantee um, uh, for the combination of those, uh, um, of those controllers. So uh, our main question here was how can we combine a set of weak predictors into a strong one in stateful systems? Okay, so uh, we assume for this work uh, that the dynamical system is stable, uh, which is a standard uh, assumption. Uh, roughly what this means is that we have some uh, memory length H, uh, which is a small uh, uh, fixed number, and um, uh, we assume that beyond that uh, constant, um, uh, or let's say the distant past in the system is negligible. Uh, so I'm not going to uh, specify exactly what this means, but roughly we can uh, construct proxy cost functions that only consider bounded memory, uh, um, um, or let's say most uh, H most recent uh, time steps, uh, and we can optimize over that. So this essentially reduces the problem to minimizing uh, finite memory proxy costs. Uh, so uh, once we have that assumption, we can construct those proxy cost functions. Um, and uh, optimize over that within the online boosting method that I mentioned uh, based on the Frank Wolf algorithm. And we refer to that algorithm as DynaBoost. Uh, so the, the guarantee that we get here is that if we have a regret bound R of T uh, for the weak learners, uh, then DynaBoost can output a sequence of um, actions U1 to UT, uh, such that the regret bound for those actions uh, is R of T uh, plus this uh, additional term here. But again, what we um, mainly achieve by this is that we've expanded the comparator class uh, from some F to the convex hull of that uh, class. So for example, if our comparator class was a, a set of neural networks, then now we can compete with the convex hull of those uh, neural networks. Um, so we're competing with a much stronger class. Um, so for a few uh, experiments we've done with this method, so in the online control setting, uh, we're comparing against the following baseline. So we have the LQR um, baseline, uh, which is uh, essentially optimal uh, in the case where the added disturbances are Gaussian, uh, and a, another baseline, which is a generalization of LQR uh, in the sense that it can work for um, any convex costs and uh, adversarial disturbances. It's a work that Elad discussed uh, yesterday. Uh, and we will use that one as the weak learner that we will apply our boosting method on top. Uh, so for the, for, for the first experiment, uh, just a sanity check, we have an LDS setting uh, and added uh, Gaussian uh, disturbances. And we've tried that in different dimension where the, the red lines are the weak learners, uh, the purple lines are the LQR, which is optimal in that setting. And we just wanted to see that uh, by boosting the weak learners, we can reach uh, much closer uh, to the um, to the LQR uh, result, which is optimal. Uh, for the next setting, uh, this is also an LDS setting, but, but now the added disturbances are no longer uh, uh, Gaussian. They are uh, correlated noise, so we have the uh, Gaussian random walk setting and the sine uh, noise setting, just cyclic uh, uh, noise. So um, in this case, LQR is no longer optimal, and we can see that it actually performs much worse in the, in the sine noise case. And um, by boosting the weak learners that we've used, we can uh, improve uh, much, uh, uh, we can improve the, the performance. Uh, we've also tried here uh, the uh, recur recurrent neural networks um, as weak learners and boosted those. So this also achieves uh, good results here. And another uh, setting, oh, I don't think I can. Yeah, so this is the, uh, uh, inverted pendulum uh, experiment where we want to stabilize a uh, pendulum in a vertically upright position and again with added uh, Gaussian random walk noise. Uh, so in this setting, uh, LQR performs much worse uh, than the weak learners and we can see that even though the weak learner performs uh, very well already, then boosting can improve that. 
And finally, we have, uh, we've done some experiments uh, in time series prediction. Uh, so um, for this uh, data set we took from the UCI machine learning repository, uh, we've tried a bunch of uh, weak learners uh, uh, T time series predictors and we've boosted them. Uh, so the weak learners with the red lines boosting are the blue lines. You can see uh, improvements in that setting as well. Thank you. So I'm gonna start off by introducing the standard setting that people do episodic RL in. I'm sure most people in the audience are familiar, uh, but it'll serve as like a good uh, contrast for how we change the setting a little bit. So typically in, in the tabular setting, you might have a discrete state and you also have discrete actions that you might select. Um, you imagine that you have rewards drawn from some reward distribution that are, uh, depend on the state and action, and it's typically a real valued quantity. Um, and then you'll also have some transition dynamics. So when you play a state and action, you'll get a new state with some probability uh, determined by this operator, and also some initial state dynamics. So the typical setup for these kinds of problems is, oh, we're going to refer to the whole setup here as the nominal MDP. It's going to be something that is, we, we see as the normal state of the world or the uncorrupted state of the world. The typical setting is we have a bunch of episodes, and at each episode, I'm going to choose some policy that's going to di dictate what actions I choose depending on what states I select, and then I'm going to observe a trajectory of, uh, of states and actions that I visit under this policy. These are going to inform the selections of my future policies in a closed loop, uh, thereby attempting to maximize reward. So the metric that is typically considered in these problems is a notion of regret. Specifically, we look at the cumulative suboptimality of our policies um, with respect to the best policy. So these are the value functions associated with the best policy, and then those are the policies we selected. Know that technically this is a random variable depending on what we did. So how does the corrupted setting differ? Well, on most episodes, we're going to assume that we observe a trajectory from the normal nominal MDP that describes the average state of the world. And that'll be this guy over here. But sometimes we're going to allow an, allow an adversary to choose a different MDP, a different set of rewards and transitions that, that are going to dictate what happens. And we're going to call this guy MK. And for simplicity, we're going to consider the same notion of regret. So what does this mean? It means that we want what the adversary selects not to corrupt our data or, or the decisions we make so much on sort of average things that might occur. And you can show that the notion of regret that also adapts to this is pretty close to this notion as well. So kind of the main goal here is we want the estimation that goes into selecting our policy not to be misled by the corruptions that we encounter. And this is a model that's been studied for a while. Um, uh, the, the, mo the most recent formulation of this, uh, or the, the most recent uh, paper that, that proposed the, most at close, the closest formulation to this in the bandit setting is due to Lacoris et al. in 2018, and there have been tons of follow-up work ever since. Okay, so I think it's important to step back for a moment and understand why are corruptions challenging in an RL setting as opposed to any other setting where people have studied corruptions at length. And I think one thing that's kind of come to be accepted in the online learning community especially is that if you have some sort of adversary you're playing against, you need to be able to randomize in some way to avoid uh, kind of succumbing to their, their adaptation to your own strategy. Now, on the other hand, what we've seen in RL is that all efficient guarantees that we know of, with the exception of a recent um, kind of Thompson sampling approach due to Dan Russo recently, but it's basically in the same spirit, they require very aggressive optimistic strategies. You build some estimate of the Q function, and then you greedily optimize that to the best of your ability. And we don't really know how to prove efficient guarantees for regret bounds if we aren't kind of going after this optimal strategy as best as we can. And unfortunately, the two can be very difficult to recon uh, reconcile. So for example, if you try to do act uniform action elimination, something that we know works very, very well in stochastic bandits, we can show that any correct action elimination that's correct in a certain sense will nev nevertheless suffer exponentially large regret. So for exponentially many episodes, actions to the horizon, uh, you're going to basically pay linear regret, which is unfortunate. So things that work in bandit world and maybe other corrupted settings that we've seen in supervised learning are not going to work in RL immediately. And we'll come back to how we get around this in a bit, but let's first present our results. So uh, a, a remark on this, the proof is by the standard combination lock instance that some of the experts in the audience might be familiar with. But the kind of key intuition is that the optimal trajectories, the ones that are necessary to get the value functions that we need to chase after to converge, are not visited with sufficiently high probability. In fact, exponentially small probability, which leads to the lower bound. So what is our result? Well, we produce an algorithm. Uh, we call it Crane. Uh, corruption robust action nested elimination. The A and the N are switched so we can get a cool name out of it. And uh, the algorithm gives us actually a non-trivial regret guarantee for the setting. So what are the kind of key things to, to pick apart? 
C refers to the number of corruptions we've encountered. This is some random variable that's adapting to what we've seen over the, over the game as it's unfolded. Uh, T is sort of the total game length, as uh, K times H. And the remaining factors are things that are standard in the um, tabular MDP kind of literature. So H refers to the horizon of each episode, S to the number of states, and A to the number of actions. And this is some lower order term, typically. So some remarks. Um, if you had order one corruptions, then we're optimal in the state and action and time parameters. Uh, we have suboptimal dependence on horizon, which some people, but certainly not all, consider to be of slightly lesser importance. Uh, uh, we also get non-trivial regret guarantees as long as uh, the corruption is sort of less than square root t. So once we're bigger than square root t, things start to break down. Um, also, you can get logarithmic regret. So we had some earlier work with a collaborator, Kevin Jamison, at University of Washington, which showed that optimistic algorithms naturally enjoy logarithmic as opposed to square root t regret for uh, tabular settings. And we can extend this to, our, to this algorithm as well. Um, it's important to compare to the literature to see what was known before. So uh, previously, there's been a lot of work on um, adversarial rewards, but for known transitions, uh, yeah, but for, for known transitions. So we're the first setting that allows uh, for, sorry, this is the second one, um, uh, first setting that allows for non-idea rewards where you don't necessarily know the transitions, but they could be stochastic. We're also the first setting that allows, in fact, for adversarial transitions as well. So we, we didn't really know how to do this. There's some things if you, some, uh, approaches that allow more feedback to the algorithm where you basically get to see every counterfactual reward you could have obtained, and then you can get around some of these limitations. But to the best of our knowledge, we're the first paper that, adreals, uh, that addresses um, uh, non-stochastic transitions and also non-stochastic rewards with unknown but stochastic transition. So these were the two challenges that we mentioned earlier. These are the things we had to get around. Uh, basically, we need to ra have randomized strategies, but we also need to undertake aggressive optimistic exploration. So the way that we get around it is we have a new kind of algorithmic and analysis paradigm for the tabular setting we call the CAT framework. Uh, and basically what it says is the following. If I have an algorithm that gets good upper and lower estimates of the Q functions, it selects actions which are compatible with these estimates, meaning that you have to select an action that's sort, of, uh, not that, that's sort of between the ranges that the Q functions would dictate, right? It's not provably a suboptimal action. It's an action whose specifically upper confidence estimate is, lower than, is larger than the largest uh, a lower confidence estimate. Um, and finally, it follows optimistic trajectories with just some constant probability that might be very small and might even be algorithm dependent. Then roughly for this class of algorithms, one can show that the regret that this algorithm achieves is at most uh, this constant kappa times the regret that optimism would achieve. And it turns out that this is the necessary ingredient to build kind of a, a kind of a more robust and hierarchical algorithm, which we use to achieve robustness in our setting. And we hope that maybe other people in the audience might find this framework useful as well, because I think it really does kind of expand the palette of, of, of things that we can try in the tabular setting and maybe other settings uh, to give us more flexibility in algorithm design. So thanks for your time, and uh, hope you guys use this theorem someday. <laughs>